Hello everyone, welcome to the third series FIG online seminars. The FIG Education Commission decided to continue with the third series of coach education online seminars for the gymnastics community. I am Monica Calabro from Argentina and today I will be the moderator of developing expressiveness in children through playing different roles. I'm really happy to share this webinar with our expert, Stacy Clark. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today, sharing all experience and knowledge. Before we start, let me introduce our expert. A former gymnast and professional circus performer, Stacy worked in marketing and communication before leaving it all behind to perform and teach circles around the world on stage, at festivals and on screen. Until 2020, Stacy was the director of casting at Cirque du Soleil, leading a team of international talent scouts and advisors. She began as a talent scout in 2007 and was the acrobatic coach on Amaluna before returning to casting. Today, Stacy is CEO of Circus Talk, the international career platform for circus and performing arts. She's also co-founder of Creative Athletic Performance, a consulting service specializing in casting, coaching, and creation. Nowadays, Stacy teaches career development and act development at San Diego Circus Center. Once again, thank you, Stacy, for being with us today. I'm excited to share something I'm very passionate about. So thank you for having me. So now Stacy will do her presentation. After that, we have a moment for question and answers at the end. So now, Stacy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Monica. Hi, everybody. I'm so pleased that you're here and able to participate. I have put together a presentation that is a combination of video clips and audio clips expressing content around the subject of expressiveness in young gymnasts. And I'm using the word young because that's where it all begins. Nurturing the joy and the pleasure of discovery and play starts at a young age. Kids have it naturally. So I'm really excited to bring this to you. And my hope is that you'll have some important takeaways that you can bring into your space. Every gym is unique. Every coaching and training plan is distinct and special, but I'm hopeful that you'll be able to mine into the presentation and take away some very practical examples of how you can bring some developing of expressiveness into your gym facility. Here we go. Welcome to developing expressiveness in young athletes. I'm a fan of the word cloud. What words would you add to a word cloud? This exercise is helpful when defining your why, which we'll explore on the next slide. Define your why. As coaches, you have goals for your athletes, both short and long-term. While some young gymnasts are naturally artistic and love dance class, I've known my fair share who just want to jump, swing, and flip. I was one of them. To truly gain your gymnast trust and buy-in, it helps to define your why. Once you've made that clear, loosen your grip and enjoy the process. Using play to develop expressiveness is fun and accessible. What kid doesn't love to play? I love this quote because it reminds us that our imaginations are limitless. And if we can imagine it, we can start down the path of creating it, whatever that it may be. No boundaries, no social constructs, no likes to achieve, no judges, no scores. Our imaginations are pure. The value of play. American psychologist Abraham Maslow said, almost all creativity involves purposeful play. 
creativity takes work, but it can and should be fun as well. Purposeful playing allows us to explore, experiment, and discover unique solutions. Hence, the staying power and proven efficacy of theater games in acting training. Within the context of gymnastics, developing expressiveness is a journey that is unique to each child. Inside of play, risk, fail, recover, discover, and play again, my favorite words are recover and discover. Two amazing skills to develop, not just in gymnasts, but in humans. Getting started. A few suggestions to help set your artistic sessions up for success. Start with a warm up, end with a game. Help your young athletes switch gears. Make this space playful. Play music they love, encourage comfy clothes, perhaps just not leotards, no ponytails, let that hair out. And remember, laughter equals fun. Creating a safe space. I'm no expert on the matter, but social media has not made being a kid any easier. Even at a young age, kids are pressured to be perfect, to get it right the first time, to follow along with their tribe and its trends. When approaching artistic sessions, I cannot underscore enough the importance of creating a safe space. Circling back to play, risk, fail, recover, discover, play, gymnasts won't even reach risk if they think their potential to fail will result in mocking, judgment, or scorn. Consider how you can make a creative or artistic space feel and be different than the gym. Whether real or pretend, separate the training floor from an environment in which anything goes. Inside that space, focus on the process, the play, and not the outcome. Some guidelines for creating a safe space. Create a vibe. Being creative is fun. Set the ground rules together. See and acknowledge everyone, especially the quiet ones. Inviting participation will build trust. There's no competition, no right or wrong. And lead by example. Get in there and play. I'm going to move into some practical examples that you can consider for your artistic training plans. But first, a hearty encouragement to embrace the learnings of social circus. Ditch the lineups and fall in love with the circle. Harmony, equality, value, inclusiveness, self-awareness and self-esteem, all ingredients that help nurture a safe space. And now some examples of warm-ups, which I will do a little bit of demonstrating on. Beginning with Pass the Pulse. This has all the participants seated in a circle, holding hands. If everyone's comfortable, eyes should be closed or at least the gaze lowered to the mat. Hoping that you're all in your appropriate COVID bubbles and that holding hands is A-OK. -okay. What happens is that a designated person is selected to begin the pulse and it's a gentle squeeze to their neighbor, passing the pulse all the way around the circle. You can start to add on to that by adding a second pulse and in response to receiving the pulse, one must then squeeze their neighbor's hand and pass it on. It's really just a moment to connect, to ground, to start building on that concept of circle. Next up is pass the clap. You can bring people up onto their feet standing and it's a similar kind of concept. It can go in either direction and this time we're passing the clap. So the hands are in a ready position and you want to pass the clap on to the neighbor who immediately takes it and passes it on to their neighbor. And when this is done very efficiently and quickly, it starts to sound like popcorn popping. The goal is to be dialed into one's neighbor, paying attention, ready to receive, ready to give. Zip, zap, zoop, and all its variations. This is a fun one, again, standing in a circle. Passing the zip, then the zap, then the zoop. So if I'm person one, I'm looking across the circle and I'm gonna pass the zip 
using my hands and my eyes to pass the energy to that person opposite me. Their goal is to then receive it, immediately pass it to somebody else altogether, and they say, zap, out loud. That person receives it, and they're sending it to the third person to say, zoop, and it goes on and on and on, zip, zap, zoop, zip, zap, zoop, as quickly as possible. Different variations on that, where you can start to do it without the hand action, just the eyes. You can invent other body actions as well to help pass the energy. You can use whatever body part to pass the zip, zap, zoop. If somebody freezes, if somebody makes a mistake, all the participants grab hands, you scoop into the middle, make some kind of crazy noise like ow, and then reposition yourself to start again. Name and movement. This is a really fun icebreaker if necessary, or just a way to start getting people to loosen up a little bit. So the idea is I'm going to present my name and I'm going to add a movement to that, which then everybody in the circle is going to repeat. I'm Stacy. Your job is to repeat exactly that. You can name my name and repeat my action. Going around the circle to get people to start to attach movement to that vocal expression, which is their name. It's an easy one. The next one's kind of fun and it's a little bit designed for exposure and vulnerability. And quite simply, still using the circle, individuals one at a time will walk into the circle and turn all the way around with their mouth wide open. This can take on a number of different expressions. It can be fear, it can be horror, it can be surprise. Whatever else happens in the face is perfectly okay. The main goal though is that each individual take their turn entering the circle, opening their mouth wide, turning all the way around so everybody can see and making their way back to their spot. Breath suspension fluidity. This is something that can be cued either by music or some vocal cues that can be led by the coach. The idea is to start attaching breath to the idea of suspension in the body and then the fluidity that can follow with an exhale. So a deep inhale coming up through the body, whether that is expressed coming up onto the toes, whether it's coming up through the shoulders and the torso, whether the breath is drawing a leg up into that suspension place. And then after the suspension, the fluidity that follows with a deep exhale. This can happen in place. It can also happen by encouraging the gymnast to move around the space. So you can really start to up the game and give more specific cues about what you're asking them to feel and express simply by breathing, simply by feeling suspension and fluidity. And finally, another one that's fun to play as a warm up is to have two individuals uh, pair up facing, uh, excuse me, one facing the back of the other. And so I'm the person in front, I have somebody behind me and I'm going to walk. I'm just going to walk around the space. And in so doing, the person behind me is trying to copy my walk, my gait, my arm swing, the length of my stride, the way I hold my carriage, where my chin tends to land. All of the little details need to be observed and then emulated. So walking around the space in a normal way, complete, no joking, no playing, just completely natural walking manner, the partner behind aims to fit in to the body rhythm of the person in front. And then of course you get to switch. This is particularly fun if gymnasts are very different in size and shape. That's not all that common in a gym. However, the goal is to really identify how each person moves in their most natural, authentic way. You can discuss afterwards with the gymnast, what did it feel like to try to put yourself into someone else's movement pattern? Oftentimes, and the goal to some degree, is to have them understand that it actually feels quite false and forced, and that the very best quality movement comes out of moving in your most natural way. Now that we're warmed up, we'll move on to some exercises, beginning with the gift. This is best done in a pair, but it can also be a small group and it includes vocals. 
So person one hands person two an imaginary gift. Person two's job is to receive that gift with glee and excitement. So for example, person one hands me the gift, I'm receiving it. Oh, it's a dead frog. I love it. I'm immediately going to abandon it and hand back a gift to my partner whose job it is to love and invent whatever it is that I have given them. The idea is that the exchange happens really rapidly to encourage spontaneity. Lines of force. In two lines, athletes face one another. They are opposite the person with whom they're going to create a line of force. And it's as though they're trying to keep tension in a rope. So together they'll move forward and back, hanging on to that tension, making sure that the rope stays taut. The non-partnered individuals, those who've been assigned to the sidelines, their job is to step in and intercept the line of force. So they will step in and steal it and grab that partner and create their own line of tension, freeing up that individual to go into a different line of tension and steal somebody else's line of force. Sensory pretending. So the five senses, touch, taste, hearing, sight, smell, the job of the coach is to throw out a cue. So it might be touch and the cue might be velvet. And the participants are reacting both in their expression and in their body language to the beautiful, soft and supple feeling of velvet. Or perhaps it's a hot stove. That reaction would be completely different. Moving into sight, they might be cued a giant or an ant. So they are to respond to that physically in their body, in their face, to whatever it is that they're seeing. Same goes for the other senses. Smell, for example, it might be a freshly baked loaf of bread or it might be a skunk. Those reactions are going to be dramatically different. Music flow improv. This one's fun and it starts to bring the breath exercise to light. So setting parameters, you might say, for example, no acro, nothing that resembles gymnastics, just movement. Perhaps there's a designated area that needs to be covered to ensure that people are traveling and taking up space. Or perhaps use of levels, making sure that at least once the participant needs to touch the ground or stand up tall on their toes, changing levels. You can set those parameters. And then play random music to which the athlete must move freely. 20 seconds, 30 seconds max, taking turns. You can start in a group sometimes to warm people up and then bring those groups down into pairs and then ideally solo. You can add in a couple extras as well, the look and the secret smile. So the look would be a cue where at least twice during that 20 second window, the athlete must make eye contact with somebody purposefully and with intention. Same goes with the secret smile. You'll encourage the athlete to think of something that gives them joy, some little secret that they have in their mind that lets their lips turn up at the corners. And at some moment in that piece, they need to have that thought. What is their secret? And what is the smile that follows? The goal of the viewers is to identify those moments. Try to identify when that person's face lit up. Moving into slow motion sequence, again, set the parameters, perhaps no acro, you'll see why. Give time to the athletes to prepare a little sequence, movement sequence. I tend to avoid the word choreography because it can sound a little intimidating and it comes with this objective of something being perfect and finished. It's just a little sequence. Their goal is to execute their sequence as slowly as possible so that every detail is afforded the same attention and importance as the next. All the nuances, all the very small moments, the slight shift of the head, of the shoulder raising, lowering, all of it. Detail. And saving the show. Here's where each participant will come in and make an entrance. They will fill the space. They will perform some type of routine, perhaps that same sequence that they've already worked on. It has to include a surprise some type of totally unexpected element. Then they'll take their bow, 
they'll acknowledge the applause that they are receiving from their peers, from their fellow gymnasts who are watching in rapt attention, and then they make their exit off stage. It's important to set the stage area so that making one's entrance, you are stepping from the wings or backstage onto the stage, doing whatever it is that you're going to do, and then purposefully making your exit. In such a physically and technically demanding sport as gymnastics, this description of paths of intention serves as a reminder to focus on the secondary paths when exploring and developing artistry. The smallest movement patterns and cues can greatly enhance a performance. For those who wish to do some additional research, I recommend the Le Bon movement, named for movement theorist, dancer, and choreographer Rudolf Le Bon. This approach helps grow one's own movement vocabulary using four components, direction, weight, speed, and flow. Each of these parts has two elements. Direction is either direct or indirect. Weight is either heavy or light. Speed is either quick or sustained. And flow is either bound or free. And finally, a few games. It is so important to close your sessions with games. As much as these are all games on some level, really just having total abandon is so much fun and the kids deserve it. Here's an all-time favorite, assassin, a dramatic death. In a circle with eyes closed, the athletes will wait while the coach circles and taps one or two or three individuals on the shoulder, signifying that they are an assassin. Everybody else is an innocent victim. Once the game begins, all of the participants are moving around on the floor, mingling, interacting, purposely going up to one another and shaking hands. If a participant receives a double squeeze in their handshake, they have been assassinated. It is their job to wait a few seconds, carry on as usual, and just a few seconds later begin their dramatic death. So they are to make vocal sounds and express in their body some dramatic way in which, totally melodramatic way in which they are going to die. Gradually, we get to the end of the list and there's only assassins wandering around shaking one another's hands. Important to really switch it up. Let everybody have a chance to be the stealthy assassin and give everybody the chance to play their dramatic death. Artists and blobs. In the group, half are artists and half are blobs. On cue, the artist must gently manipulate their blob into positions and shapes. Now it's important here to respect boundaries and that can be talked about. And to be reminded that we're not trying to put people into weird contortion positions. Respectfully, the artist can take their blob and position them into different shapes, encouraging them to move their body with those physical cues, those physical prompts. On the signal, the artist moves to the next blob and rotates. So they're going to reshape what has been done by the preceding artist. Just a reminder to make sure to switch teams that everybody gets a chance to be an artist and everybody gets a chance to be a blob. Moving on, we have dance battle, sort of the classic. It's two teams who are going to face off one to one. Here again, using music that's rather unexpected and varied is an awful lot of fun. Nobody can prescribe anything or create choreography in advance if they don't know what music they're going to get. So for about 30 seconds, 20 to 30 seconds, one member from each team will face off and they will just let loose and do an epic dance battle. The job of the coach is really to mix it up with some crazy unexpected music. Everything from heavy metal to nursery rhymes. Have fun with it. Emotional chairs. Using chairs or cushions or designated areas that are seating areas on the mat. Every zone will have an emotion attached to it. You can just write that on a piece of paper, tape it onto the chair. Same number of chairs as participants. As the music plays, the gymnast will walk around and when the music stops, they must sit down and start to act out the emotion that is assigned to their spot. 
mugging. Mugging is when two or three, it can be done with two or three players. Uh, usually there's a person in the lead and a couple of people behind and that will constantly change because the people behind are trying to mug and play up and tease and sort of surprise the person in front without getting caught. So the same way that kids will put fingers up behind their friend's head in a class photo, the mug behind the person in front is being a complete goofball and then they must stop the moment that the person in front turns around or starts to observe that. And this role is ever changing. You can often take a specific trajectory, so asking everybody to start here and finish here, making sure that they follow that path and take turns switching roles as they go. And finally, ongoing is pedestrian photography. This is something that I really enjoy doing and the kids love it as well. It's a little sneak peek into the creation of choreography on one's own body. It's something that you can do a little bit in each session. So you will assign each individual a body part and it's their job to make up some type of little movement or sequence just using that body part. Whether that's my right arm or my left leg or my torso, my head, whatever piece, make sure that we play with the hips as well making sure that each participant comes up with some type of little sequence or move assigned to that body part. They will then teach that sequence to everybody else and slowly but surely, you stitch it all together. In so doing, you are creating a group choreography. So there's a couple things at play here. One is just discovering how it is that one moves one's own body. And then the other thing is memory developing the ability to design something and then have to teach it to somebody else and then build up your ability to remember a whole lengthy series of movements that become a choreography. Two lovely quotes to close. Today you are you that is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you. Every young athlete has expressiveness waiting to be unleashed. May they be supported in discovering their most authentic selves. My thanks to the education programs team for inviting me to participate. I wish all of you the very best and remember, life is more fun if you play games. Thank you, Stacy, for this really interesting presentation. I'm sure the topics and the way you have approached are helpful not only for artistic gymnastics, but also for all those disciplines that use music and need to explore and improve the expressiveness. We know the artistic presentation and interpretation are important in our disciplines, and this guideline will give us a clear way to develop it. On the other hand, the new code of points reinforce the importance of improving the expressiveness to make the floor exercise more attractive and beautiful. So, well, here is my first question. How often or in which period of the year you work the developing of expressiveness? I want to know if you work monthly, weekly, or perhaps 30 minutes each training day. Frequency. Okay, so my, I have some suggestions that I'd like to share, but I think it's really important that each coach, each training facility consider their own needs and their own realities, because this is not something that can be prescribed one size fits all, in my opinion. Even more than the precision of whether it's weekly or monthly, I feel the important ingredient is that it be consistent that it start early, that the exploration of creativity becomes something that all kids, all athletes can start to really look forward to and feel comfortable with. And that is simply just like the sport of gymnastics, practice. That's doing it consistently and regularly. So more tends to be better, but we know how demanding a training schedule can be and how there is so much going on in any designated training window. I think that having slightly shorter windows of time. So for example, 
um, 30 or 45 minutes perhaps weekly in a perfect world. I would even say more than once a week, even possibly where different types of warm ups and exercises might be built into daily training, either as an opener or as a closer toward the end of the practice. Being able to make it something that is consistent, that is presented as being fun, almost like a treat at the end of a difficult training where the focus and energy has been very, very high and intense. This is a way to release and just lean into the playfulness that we all have naturally. So it's something that needs to be considered uniquely by each coach for their gymnast, for wherever those gymnasts are on their pathway, but more than anything else, it's consistency. Sometimes when we do these kind of exercises, the gymnast can develop the proposal satisfactory, but then they don't show the same during the whole routine with the acrobatics line. What should we do to succeed on this? Monica, I think you have hit on something that is at the very crux of the sport of gymnastics, the very high demands in the technical space, and then the high expectations and increasing expectations around how to bring artistic expression into equal weight with that technical prowess. You're absolutely right. I think we've all seen it and experienced it where some gymnast who is very artistic and, and very naturally elegant and fluid and open and playful in their non-technical play struggles to bring that in when they have a very demanding tumbling pass or skills that they're very very concentrated on so it's the million dollar question i think my take on this is that by making the artistic expression second nature that is to be doing it so consistently and to be nurturing that very authentic and natural movement quality in an athlete will let them not have to think about it. They will simply step into the arena, step onto stage, step onto the floor. And just like you do with the high level of repetition of a technical skill, skill rely on to some degree the body and the mind knowing what to do when it's time to do the job. I do think that there are occasions and where the sport has gone, uh, there's been occasions where the, in, the focus has taken away from the artistry. It's a little bit of an afterthought. We need to do these types of elements to fulfill that criteria. And let's just slide them in there someplace and get it done and put the focus back on the high technical pass. I, I really think to balance those scales, it needs to be a mindset. It needs to be a commitment to letting that expressiveness and the, the storytelling component of acrobatics come to life. That is giving it space. It's giving it appropriate credit. It's giving it time for the athletes to make it as natural as the type of focus that they develop to be able to execute those skills. Not sure exactly if that's a perfect singular finite answer. I think that a lot of it starts from the influence of the coach and the choreographer and the team around that athlete to be reminded and to be nurturing of how important the expressiveness component is. Small cues even such as you're stepping out onto the floor, but really you're stepping out onto the stage. You are not just executing what it is that you know how to do, you are performing what it is that you know how to do. Taking it up a notch to understand that the ability to express transcends just the acrobatic movement. It's really the beautiful marriage of both. That's what makes this sport so amazing. Most of the exercise you propose are in group or couples. There could be also any time when they should be alone and in front of the other or not? Indeed, a lot of the work is in small groups, um, sometimes paired, as you mentioned. A lot of that is to be able to create 
and enhance the safe space that I talked about. Taking the pressure off the performative aspect of creativity. Having a buddy, having a friend, uh, a gymnast colleague beside you to be able to bounce ideas off of, to be able to giggle with a little bit, to be able to feel just a little more secure in taking risks. All of this really leads toward developing the, the more second nature aspect of stepping out of your comfort zone. So those exercises are really designed purposely to be done in groups to give that enhanced sense of safety, security. I'm not alone in this. I'm not going to look like I'm being silly or out of place or taking too big of a risk. I can do this within the comfort and exploration of my peer group. Over time, I would absolutely start to suggest bringing those group numbers down. So if it's been a, a small cluster of five, perhaps it becomes three, perhaps it then becomes two. All the while, you can equally train the other participants to be excellent audience members. So when it comes time to do a show and tell or a presentation of an exercise, already the audience is built in and already they're there engaged in the exercise themselves and being encouraging and in allowing their fellow gymnasts to step out of that comfort zone. Over time, and of course, as it relates specifically to floor exercise and individual choreography, these are designed to be transferable skills. It's really developing the toolkit first that will then enable a gymnast to go into a session with a choreographer or with a coach and start to create what it is that they're doing uniquely for their floor exercise. Up until that time, allowing for the fact that we don't tend to love taking risks for fear, especially creative risk, for fear of failure. Putting in that little bit of extra padding with the peers is very much a, a comfort factor. Thank you, Stacy, so much for this amazing presentation. Finally, I want to thank to FIG Education Commission and FIG staff for all the support during this organization of this webinar. Please look at our online seminars at the FID Education channel. Stay safe, and I hope to see you soon.